just a quick warning, this video will contain explicit and sexual content. The video will tell some gruesome details about murder victims and crimes committed by a very disturbed individual. This is not a topic that can be treaded lightly, and as such, viewer discretion is advised. Hi everybody, it's Curious Raven with another true crime. Like I said, this is another correctional officer murder that has happened in the state of Florida. This one bothers me so much just because what this criminal monster did to her. I want to go ahead and let you know about who she was. Her name was Donna Fitzgerald. She was born October 3rd, 1957 in Parsons, West Virginia. She graduated from Kingwood High School in New Hampshire in 1975, where she was crowned homecoming carnival queen. She graduated with honors. She then moved to Springfield, Massachusetts and attended Springfield Technical Community College, graduating with honors with a degree in teaching. She then also graduated from Westfield State College in Westfield, Massachusetts with a degree in criminal justice. She moved to Daytona Beach in 1985 where she made her home. Donna was currently employed for 13 years as a correctional officer at the Tomoka Correctional Institution. She also worked part-time for special events for the Daytona Beach International Speedway during race week and bike week. Donna was preceded in death by her, her father, her mother, one brother, and one sister. She also loved her grandmother as well. The most important one that she left was her 20-year-old son named Kyle. Donna had a great passion for life. She loved the beach. Her greatest treasures were her son and her friends, and her family. She had great compassion for others, and loved to help people as she had a heart of gold. Her beautiful smile and infectious laughter will be greatly missed by her friends and family. Friends are the sunshine of life. Now, what I just said actually came from her obituary. When myself got into the department, I, I heard of this incident. It's like they try to warn you about, hey, this has happened in the past. Don't let it happen to you. So like I said, correctional officer Donna Fitzgerald was a 50-year-old single mother of a 20-year-old son named Kyle. She had been working for the Florida Department of Corrections for 13 years at Tomoka Correctional Institute in Daytona Beach, Florida. I want to advise you this story will have some gruesome and sad parts. This happened on August 24th, 2008, during the evening hours. Officer Fitzgerald had decided to pick up extra overtime at work. She was tasked to supervise 13 inmates that included five of them rapists, seven killers, and the last a robber. They were working in the Pride Building on Institute grounds. Pride stands for Prison Rehabilitative Industries and Diversified Enterprises Incorporation, where the inmates were refurbishing vehicles. Now, this also included inmate Hall, that will be charged later on in this story. He was a welder working on vehicles. The way they found out something was wrong is when Sergeant Webster was working at Tomoka CI Control Room Supervisor, where she was responsible for getting a count from all the areas as to the number of inmates in each area to make sure no one was missing. When Webster had not heard from Fitzgerald, who was working in the Pride Building that night, Webster radioed Officer Weber, who went to the Pride facility with Sergeant McNeil to search for Officer Fitzgerald. Webster saw Hall, inmate Hall, run through an open door on the other end of the Pride Buildings, and Weber and McNeil pursued Hall. Weber called up to Hall, who repeatedly said, I freaked out, I snapped, I killed her. Hall responded to Weber's commands and placed his hands on the wall and was handcuffed. Weber took possession of the pride keys that Hall had in his hands, the ones that he stole from Officer Fitzgerald. 
Officer Birch shouted from inside the building, Officer down! And Hall remained outside with the other officers, while Captain Wiggins and Officers Weber and McNeil entered the building and located Fitzgerald's body. Fitzgerald's body was found laying face down on top of a cart in the paint room. The upper part of her body was wrapped in a gray wool blanket, and the bottom half of her body rested over the back of the cart, with her pants and underwear pulled down to her knees. Inside a bucket of water that was on the floor next to Fitzgerald's legs was inmate Hall's bloody t-shirt. Hall was escorted to the medical facility, of the prison by officers Dickerson and Schweit. Several officers took turns watching inmate Hall while he sat in the medical building. Hall was later escorted to the conference room to talk with investigators from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and then to a cell. He gave three statements to FDLE agents throughout the night regarding the events of the murder. Daniel Radcliffe, a crime scene investigator for FDLE, testified that he found two packets of pills in a file cabinet in the paint room of Pride where the body was discovered. The pill packets had an inmate's name on them, Franklin Prince, and were labeled ibuprofen 800 milligrams and a generic Tregatol 200 milligrams and anti-seizure med medication. Hall's white t-shirt was found in the bucket of water with other shirts in the paint room and inmate Hall's pants were found in a pile of clothes also in the paint room. Months later, inmate Hall's blue prison shirt was found lodged on top of a paint booth. Granules of Speedy Dry, an oil absorbent material, were found on the ground in the front of the welding shed and in a coffee can next to the shed. The granules tested positive for blood, and DNA tested confirmed that it was Fitzgerald's. A broom found nearby had Fitzgerald's blood on the broom head. Blood was found on the walls of the welding shed. Also found in the welding shed was a cap, which had Fitzgerald's blood on it as well. Inmate Hall's clothes, including his underwear, tested positive for Fitzgerald's blood. A sexual assault analysis was performed on Fitzgerald's body. A crime lab analyst with the FDLE testified that there was no evidence of semen on the body. Wiggins testified that he was a commander of the Tomoka CI Rapid Response Team and as part of his job would search prisons for weapons. Wiggins testified that shanks made in the Pride facility differed from the usual ones made by inmates, and that they had a machine edged made by a grinder. Wiggins testified that the shank recovered from the wall of the paint room, which appeared to be the murder weapon, had a meticulously sharpened point, like those made from a tool grinder in the Pride facility. The state played the three confessions Hall made on the night of the murder, and the first statement given to FDLE agents and Tomoka CI personnel Hall admitted to killing Fitzgerald and stated that he had taken four pills that Frank Prince, another inmate working in Pride, had given to him. Later that day, when his shift ended, Hall went looking for more pills, but was unable to find any and became angry. Officer Fitzgerald came in and laughed and called Hall by his nickname. Possum, come on, get out of there. Hall told her to get out. Fitzgerald grabbed Hall's arm, and that's when he freaked out and began to stab her with a sharp piece of metal that he found on the floor of the room. Hall then took off his bloody shirt, put it in a bucket of water, and put on one of Prince's shirts. He picked up the pride keys and continued to look for pills. Hall stated that he did not remember pulling Fitzgerald's pants down. Hall said that he did not want to have sex with Fitzgerald. Hall repeatedly stated that he just wanted to get high. The second statement, given around 1.30 a.m., was taken by Agent Miller of the FDLE upon Hall's request in the cell in which Hall had been placed in. During this interview, Hall admitted that he killed Fitzgerald somewhere other than the room where she was found. Fitzgerald found Hall searching for pills in the office. He ran out past her. 
She chased him to the welding shed, and he stabbed her there. Hall carried her to the office and placed her on the car. Hall said he threw some dirt on the blood outside. Near the welding shed, Hall told Miller that he had hid the knife in a center block wall near the welding shed. Hall also told Miller he did not think he was going to make it tomorrow. Miller told Hall that he would transport him to the branch jail in a little while. The third statement was given around 3.30 a.m. that same night and was made only to the FDLE agents. In the third statement, Hall agreed that in his first statement, he said he killed Fitzgerald inside the Pride building. But in his second statement, he admitted to killing her in the welding area outside the Pride building. Hall admitted that he stayed behind in the Pride building to look for some drugs. While looking for drugs, Hall found the shank by the sink in Prince's office and took it with him. When he realized Fitzgerald was looking for him, Hall hid inside the welding shed. Fitzgerald opened the shed door and came in and tried to grab him. He tried to run past her, but she would not let go, so he stabbed her. He did not recall how many times he stabbed her, but said he stabbed her enough times just to get by. Fitzgerald fell to the ground inside the shed. He did not know whether or not she was alive. He hid the shank in the wall and spread some speedy dry on the ground in the welding area to soak up the blood. He wrapped her up in a towel and blankets and carried her back to the paint room office. Hall placed her on the cart. He then continued to look for pills, but was not able to find any. Hall went back to the room where Fitzgerald was and pulled down her pants. He did not sexually assault her. Hall said he put his shirt in a bucket of water, put on Prince's shirt, but kept on his own pants. Correction officers entered the Pride facility, and he attempted to run from them. Now, they did bring doctors in. Dr. Bullock, the Volusia County Associate Medical Examiner, testified that the injuries Fitzgerald sustained based on her autopsy results. He said that Fitzgerald's body bore evidence of blunt force injuries, mostly on her face consistent with those caused by punches from a hand. Fitzgerald's hands and arms had sustained defensive wounds caused by a sharp instrument, consistent with a knife. Fifteen additional stab wounds were inflicted upon Fitzgerald, including on her stomach, back, and chest. Dr. Bullock also testified that a gold chain necklace on Fitzgerald's body had been pulled tightly around her mouth and neck from behind in a manner so as to exert sufficient force to leave a post-mortem mark consistent with strangling mark. Now, October 23, 2009, this asshole that hurt this woman that was just trying to do her damn job was convicted for first-degree murder. The state offered evidence that Hall was serving two consecutive life sentences when he murdered Fitzgerald, so he was a lifer. The state also offered evidence that Hall had committed prior violent felonies, introducing testimony from two women who Hall had raped. This right here is some background stated by Hall's father. Hall was a good son and got along well with his two younger brothers. He also testified that Hall had been raped in jail at age 19 when his girlfriend's mother's boyfriend arranged to have him put in jail after a dispute. After his release, Hall became afraid and mostly stayed home, and he eventually started living in a shelter in the woods. His father had not seen his son since 1995. Hall's mother, Betty Hall, also testified regarding her son's love for sports growing up. Dr. Hines Adenis testified through the telephone that he and Hall had played sports together in high school, and that Hall was an excellent athlete. Bruce Hall, the former plant manager for Pride, testified that Hall started at Pride as an apprentice welder and eventually worked his way up to lead welder. Now, that's when he was in prison. Rodney Callahan, an inmate who used to work with Hall, described him as a very good worker and responsible. The defense tried to come forward and say maybe his behavior was due to the pills he took. But Dr. Daniel Buffington, 
a pharmacologist testified for the defense that among other possible side effects, both ibuprofen and Tegretol have the capacity to alter someone's behavior. The state called Dr. Wade Myers on rebuttal, who testified that most people who take an overdose of ibuprofen do not have any side effect, and the remaining people complain of nausea, and Tegretol has an anti-aggression component to it. His opinion? It would be very unlikely to cause aggression. He actually said, you're going to get the opposite effect. The defense also tried to say he was emotionally damaged and in support of the defense's contention that Hall should receive the emotionally and mentally disturbed dagitory mitigator. Dr. Kropp testified for the defense that Hall had a cognitive disorder, not otherwise specified, coercive paraphilia disorder, multiple sexual offender, and an alcohol substance abuse disorder. Crop testified that Hall had a serious emotional disorder at the time of the offense and that Hall's ingestion, Tegretol, could bring out his underlying psychological traits. Well, then here comes the state. They offered a rebuttal, and it was from Dr. Reeb Same, a forensic psychologist and professor of psychology, and Dr. Dan Zicker, a board-certified forensic psychiatrist. Rip Same testified that the results of the test administered to Hall by Crop were questionable because Crop failed to test for malingering. Dan Zicker testified that he administered two tests to determine whether Hall was mentally ill or was malingering. A score of more than 14 is highly correlated with malingering, and Hall's score was 29. Dan Zeger arrived at the opinion that Hall has a history of substance abuse, adult antisocial behavior, history of sexually related charges, possibly a psychosexual disorder, a pseudo seizure disorder by history. Sorry, I do not know how to say that word. Now, right now, I'm actually just reading the deposition of the whole murder, what happened in the trial. Um, it gives really, you know, public good information, sums it all up. This was horrible, what this man did to her. I'm telling you, drug addiction is real and it'll make you do some crazy stuff, but not to take someone's life. That is unacceptable. I'm going to continue reading the deposition. Dan Ziger strongly disagreed with any attempt by Buffington to diagnose a psychological condition and disagreed with Buffington's opinion that Tegretol could unmask an underlying psychological illness. The trial court found that Hall did not establish the existence of mental or emotional disturbance as a statutory mitigating circumstance and gave it no weight. In the trial court sentencing order, the court found five aggravators. One, he had previous conviction of a felony and under sentence of imprisonment had a really great weight. This means you're already in prison and if you actually break a law in prison, it actually has outside charges and you can actually get extra time, like murdering Officer Fitzgerald. He actually gets sentenced to death because he was already had two life sentences. And these lifers that do have a life sentence, you have to be careful when you're an officer because they have nothing to lose. If they want to kill you or hurt you or really mess with you as an officer, they can. And not even care because why? Why care? He's just going to just stay in prison for the rest of his life. Kind of glad that they gave him the death sentence because that was the next step. Um, My opinion on the death sentence is that they should bring back all the old types of sentencing like hanging and firing squad and guillotine. I don't feel that the inmate laying on the, the bed and just having a thing injected into a IV that does not hurt him at all. And then he just go to sleep and never wakes up. I don't feel like that's enough. And some, I want them to stay in prison and rot. And I'm telling you, 
prison, especially in Florida. If you are a typical regular inmate and you go by the rules and you don't get in trouble and you try to help out and you try to make the most of your prison sentence, most of your time that you're there, you, it, it's so easy. I mean, yeah, it sucks. You have People that tell you what to do, when to do it, where to do it, how to do it. But that's the point. That is your punishment of whatever you did. But y'all, they still have hot showers. And not bad food because I have eaten the inmate food at the prison. They get just, if they're not working, I mean, yes, some of them do go into shifts and they work. But it's not all day. They just come in relax, lay around, read, watch TV, play card games, listen to music, go to rec when they call rec, and they get canteen where they can get all their little goodies and snacks and sodas, and it is, it's just, it's, it's crazy. They get clean clothes. Um, I will say one thing is that it does get kind of hot in the dorms when it's but they have fans, big gigantic fans in the dorm. So it's not like they're going to pass out, you know. They get cold water, hot water for soups and all that kind of stuff. They get to go to church because they have church every night. When they go eat, they eat in the chow hall. They get medical. They have a dentist. They have a doctor, nurses, anything happens that's, you know, out of the capacity of what medical can do they get called out to the hospital. But I'm telling y'all, prison is like camp, you know? And they also have like, um, they get to see their families on the weekends. They get to talk to them through a kind of like a, a video visitation if they decide to do that. They have tablets. They can watch movies if they want to and listen to music and yeah, they have to pay their own money to get that kind of luxury in a prison. I mean, you're in prison. You're not, you're supposed to be suffering for the, the things that you did. But to me, these guys just, they're not. I'm sorry. I went off on a rant and let me get back to it. Number two, previously convicted of another capital felony or felony involving the use of threat of violence to a person. That had great weight. Number three. Committed to disrupt, hinder the lawful exercise of any government function or the enforcement of laws. That has a great weight. Number four, especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Very great weight. Number five, cold, calculated, and premeditated. Very great weight. Six, the victim of the capital felony was a law enforcement officer engaged in the performance of his or her official duties. No weight merged with aggravator number three as listed above. In mitigation, the sentence in court found no statutory mitigators and eight non-statutory mitigating circumstances. One, Hall was a good son and brother. Some weight. Two, Hall's family loves him. Little weight. Three, Hall was a good athlete who won awards and medals. Little weight. Hall was a victim of sexual abuse. Some weight. Number five, Hall was productively employed while in prison. Some weight. Hall cooperated with law enforcement. Some weight. Hall showed little remorse. Little weight. Eight, Hall displayed appropriate courtroom behavior, little weight. The trial court concluded that the, the aggravating circumstances far outweighed the mitigation and gave great weight to the jury's unanimous recommendation of death. Thus, the trial court imposed a sentence of death. Now, this is things that the defense, you know, started going, oh no, we lost. And they're like pulling stuff out their butt trying to, oh, this, this is why. Let me read them. Juror challenge. Hall first asserts that trial counsel was ineffective for using a peremptory strike on prospective juror Rapone. 
instead of striking her for cause, and that this peremptory strike should have been used to challenge prospective jury Roddy instead. Hall argues that Roddy was biased because he supervised a full-time Tomoka CI corrections officer at his work, and he had discussed Hall's case with this officer. We disagree. Confirmation of her ability to follow the law and counsel's belief that she would be a good guilt phase juror, counsel's decisions not to challenge the juror, was reasonable and a matter of trial strategy. Furthermore, we hold that Hall has failed to show deficient performance for this claim. All right, the next claim is a prejudice claim. Okay, let's get into it. Furthermore, Hall has not established prejudice. He has failed to show that the juror in question was actually biased. Competent, substantial evidence supports the post-conviction court's determination that juror Ruddy's work relationship with a TCI officer did not establish actual bias. Therefore, we conclude that Hall has failed to establish juror Roddy's actual bias, and the result of Hall's case thus would have remained the same. Therefore, we concluded that his claim fails. Yeah, the third thing that he is trying to argue about, ineffectiveness of the guilt phase. Hall next argues that his trial counsel was ineffectively at the guilt phase for failing to adequately investigate, develop a defense, and challenge the state's case. We disagree. Primarily, Hall has failed to establish prejudice, competent, substantial evidence supports the post-conviction court's finding that trial counsel were not ineffective at the guilt phase. Notably, for all of the subclaims addressed below, none of the alleged deficiencies would have rebutted Hall's own confession that he hid from C.O. Fitzgerald in the welding shed with a shank after she confronted him in Prince's office while he was looking for pills. The confession establishes the premeditation in the state's case, and none of the alleged deficiencies would have rebutted this evidence. Therefore, we conclude that Hall has failed to establish prejudice with regard to this claim. This is starting to get too much. I'm going to go ahead. Then Mr. Hall did his job normal that day. There was nothing unusual about him. He wasn't acting weird, nothing out of the ordinary. So we were also reluctant to call witnesses who might have testified because we had the defense of the pills that Mr. Hall was testifying or was acting normally that he was acting like he did every day and he wasn't acting unusual. We find that competent, substantial evidence supports the post-conviction court's finding and they made a strategic decision not to present evidence of the alleged stressful work conditions at Pride in light of the lack of corroborating evidence from co-workers. Had they chosen to present this evidence, the state almost certainly would have rebutted the evidence by bringing to light the fact that all the inmates at Pride may have experienced stress, yet none of them murdered C.O. Fitzgerald. Furthermore, evidence about stressful work conditions would likely have also led to rebuttal testimony about Hall seemingly normally, normal behavior on the days leading up to the murder, and on the day of the murder, which would directly contradict the defense's theory that Hall was high on pills that caused him to freak out. Therefore, we find the subclaim fell. Now, Pride is like a third entity. It's like the state, and then they subcontract, you know, another company to have inmates as labor, practically. I mean, you know. So, this one is Pride Overtime Closing Procedures. So, Hall is going to argue something about this. Hall next argues that trial counsel were deficient for failing to present evidence of Pride's closing procedures for the overtime shift and officers' use of chemical agents and body alarms when supervising the Pride facility as a way to rebut the state's contention that he was lying and wait for C.O. Fitzgerald and place fault on the victim for the murder. 
we find that Hall has failed to establish deficiency under the subclaim. First off, I'm going to tell you, he ambushed her. Um, it was premeditated because he waited on her with a shank. He was so fiending for some type of drug that he wanted her to get out of the way. Because after he killed her, he kept on looking for more pills. Makes me so upset. I'm trying to blame the officer. Oh, well, you know, she had chemical agents that she could have sprayed me with. She did have a body alarm. No, dude, you came around a corner and ambushed her. She did not expect that, that was going to happen. I am pretty sure, you know, it was late. It was, what, like 7.30 when they found her body? So she was trying to do it on her own. I mean, I have been, y'all, I have been on a wreck field with like 1,200 inmates. I have been in a dorm with 170 inmates by myself. I have been in chapel with like over 200 inmates by myself. They don't mean to do it on purpose, but that's the point about being a correctional officer. It's dangerous. And we sacrifice our lives to try to keep these people in line and where they don't rebuttal and try to escape the prison to go hurt people. It's normal. I mean, I've taken a crew of 20 inmates to go paint. It was during the day, but it's part of the job. We do dangerous things. And it's not this woman's fault. She was just trying to do her job like she was supposed to. I will say that it sucks because people do get complacent and they work with certain inmates every day or you get kind of comfortable because you know the inmate, you know, I meant you have to talk to them every day and, and they manipulate. They fake who they are. And I always tell new officers that you can't trust like that. You know, don't fall into that because you could be working with an inmate for seven years on the same work crew and then bam, he might stab you in the neck one day just out of nowhere. And you got comfortable because you've been around this inmate for seven years and, you know, complacency. That's what they call it. Not saying that she was. I just feel so bad for the family that lost their loved one from a, a sicko doing this to her. How she was found broke my heart. Then he tried to claim that there was unsupervised access to sheet metal and grinders. No, you are supervised. There's an officer there. She was outside, shutting down everything. And then you just didn't respond. So she went back in to see where you were. And she found you in the office trying to get some pills. You ran. She followed you. You intentionally picked up a piece of metal and hit it. It is not the fault of Pride or the officer. So, you know, they said, nay, nay. Then also Hall tried to like do a sub claim that, oh, well, it's the officer's fault. Y'all didn't do a um, toxicology screen on me to corroborate Hall's statement. He was under the influence of Tegretol pills at the time of the murder. They've already established that them pills don't do nothing to you. Y'all, this man tried every single Wow, listen to this. Inconsistencies in Hall's confessions. Hall next alleges that trial counsel were deficient both at the suppression hearing and the guilt phase of trial for failing to present testimony and medical evidence of Hall's injuries to explain the inconsistencies in Hall's confessions. We hold, the Hall, we hold that Hall has failed to establish this subclaim. Really? They are grasping for straws. Literally saying, oh, well, mistrial. Or, oh, well, this is an issue because y'all didn't go through my stories that I told you three times that night. Wow. Ha. Huh. Really? Now you're trying to blame yourself? I just, everything, everything. Suppression of hearing. Um, no. Hall did get an injury, a black eye, in confrontation with Miss Fitzgerald during the incident where she was killed. 
Okay. He had on his back, bru- he was bruised and scratched. Well, I wonder why the woman was trying to fight for her damn life. He's trying every freaking little thing to blame the officers, to blame the prison, to blame pride. Um, dude, you murdered someone. Like, in cold blood. You're not getting out of this one. I mean, it's like case closed. Halsnack's claim contends that trial counsel was ineffective for failing to object to C.O. Evans' trial testimony concerning the procedures that he followed when closing down the Pride overtime shift because he was not listed on the state's witness list and only testified about the procedures that he personally followed in closing down Pride rather than those that C.O. Fitzgerald and all supervising Pride officers followed. We disagree. Frederick Evans, who testified at trial for the state, worked the overtime shift at Pride around the time of the murder. C.O. Evans testified as to the procedures he followed when closing down the Pride overtime shift, which included locking up all tools and offices before closing and searching all inmates before dismissing them. Evans testified that he noticed that Hall had developed a habit of being the last inmate to leave Pride. But he would have never allow an inmate to stay behind after the supervising officer left. Evans also testified that Hall usually worked alongside another welder. When Hall was late coming to check out, the other welder he worked with was, on occasion, also one of the last inmates to check out of Pride. That's kind of weird. Like, they're trying to hide something... Or do something to hide stuff before they walk out when the CEO's not looking? Oh, Hall admitted that he had considered raping Fitzgerald after he had killed her. He's a monster. So I'm just going to wrap this up. I want to read the last of this to y'all. Then I will let you know my little opinion. Also, in 2010, Fitzgerald's family sued for wrongful death suit for her murder. It was said that the compound was not taking regular security checks with Officer Fitzgerald while she was alone at night in the Pride building with that dangerous criminal. But I couldn't find anything um, if they won or if they didn't. I looked. It was very hard to find information about this. only found that they, they did file one. You know, when there are officers out in the field that they're not like on the main compound you're supposed to do security checks um i've done them work crews that are out they call in and they let me know okay i'm safe like every hour and i write it down and then if for some reason i feel like one hasn't called like over an hour i will call them to make sure they're they're okay sometimes you know they just get busy with the working and everything and They're a little late calling in. So, the sergeant of the control room, um, they, she did correctly. She called to see if she was okay, and she didn't answer. And then they went to go look for her. Uh, In 2017, six years ago on June 25th, a subsequent investigation, Department of Corrections Inspector General blamed the warden, Jerry Cummings, and his top commanders for critical security breaches, gross neglect of duty, and ineptitude. Those errors, the probe said, ultimately permitted an inmate to ambush and murder Fitzgerald, who was working late at night, alone, supervising a crew of rapists and violent offenders, some of them lifers, who had access to sharp tools as part of a prison work program. Despite the blistering criticism and demotion, Cummings' career didn't suffer much. He and his top staffers were reassigned, and within a few years, he was back on top as warden at Dade Correctional Institute, south of the homestead. In 2019, Hall appealed his case but was rejected. The U.S. Supreme Court on Tuesday refused to take up an appeal by a Florida death row inmate convicted in the 2008 murder of a correctional officer at Tomoka Correctional Institute. Justices is common, did not explain their reasons for declining to hear the appeal by inmate Enoch Hall, 
Justice Sonia Sotomayor dissented in 2016. I know this is kind of going out of order a little bit. I am sorry about that. The appeal was rooted in a 2016 U.S. Supreme Court ruling that found Florida's death penalty sentencing system was unconstitutional because it gave too much authority to judges instead of juries. A subsequent Florida Supreme Court ruling said juries must unanimously agree or critical findings before judges can impose death sentences and must unanimously recommend the death penalty. Hall's attorneys pointed to an alleged error in how the 2016 U.S. Supreme Court ruling in a case known as Hearst v. Florida was carried out. So they were trying to... You know, because 2016 is when they changed the law or rule of that. But he killed her in 2008 and in 2010 was sentenced to death. So, too bad he missed it. Um, Because I know that when they passed that, there was a lot of criminals that actually went from um, death row inmates to just lifers in prison because of the new rule or some words that the secretary said when officer fitzgerald passed away the incident the murder words cannot express the sorrow i feel over the loss of our correctional officer said department of corrections secretary walter mcnell entire department grieves the murder of one of our finest officers and we pray for the victim's family during this difficult time in 2011, I found this blog that was for Donna, and I found some words that her mom wrote to show how just upsetting this was to her. I mean, I would be so upset too. Donna's mother's words in 2011, she said, I will spend the rest of my life for fighting for justice for my daughter. Officer Donna Fitzgerald and her son Kyle. Donna's murder was so preventable. The corrupt Pride Prison Work Program and Florida DOC are responsible for Donna's murder. Their profit for Pride was worth more than an officer's life. And for her son, I will be my daughter's voice and reveal just how her friends, family, attorney, media, and a very corrupt foundation seek publicity and profits from the murder of a dedicated officer that finished her shift, was asked to cover a shift for a private prison work program, Pride. The facts are there. The truth is there. I will find justice for my daughter and her son, Kyle. She feels that the prison failed her. The security protocols failed her. I would feel the same way if this happened to my husband. He's a sergeant in a prison. And, you know, me, I don't work anymore due to medical issues. That is such a stressful job, y'all. Having to be always on your toes. Always fighting back with inmates. They are so manipulative and they will do anything to get what they want. I've seen many officers lose their jobs because inmates have manipulated them. See, you gotta be strong-willed to do this type of job. This breaks my heart. I know that was kind of a lot. What I know is that I'm just going to kind of like give you a synopsis. Sort of like a quick, this is what happened. In Tomoka in 2008, in their state prison, there was a officer, Fitzgerald, that was there for 13 years. She was a seasoned officer as well. She took up an extra shift to, you know, get more hours. She had her a son she had to take care of. And in a building... That was for the pride program where the inmates would work and do labor. A welder inmate named Enoch Hall, he was actually 39 years old at the time, had wanted pills, wanted them so bad that he would hurt anyone. She started closing everything up and was more towards the front of the building with the other inmates waiting for him to come out. And when she called him and he did not come out, she went in. And she found him in the office trying to go through filing cabinets and stuff to find pills. He couldn't find them. When he saw Fitzgerald, he ran. And she ran after him. I mean, that's our job. She can't have him just running around. There's no telling what he would do if he was unsupervised. 
she had to follow him. At this point, like I, if I put myself in her shoes, I wouldn't see that my life was in danger at that point. He ambushed her and stabbed her. And she fought back. She was stabbed more than 25 times. And he belittled and berated her of pulling her pants down and her underwear so the whole world could see. That is the most heartbreaking thing. I'm very happy that the prison did what they're supposed to do. Yes, not everything is perfect. Stuff falls through the cracks. But they did go to try to find her. And they did. You know, it's too late. He was so fiending over some type of drug that he literally wrapped her up and was like, oh, I didn't know if she was dead or not. Dude, really? She ain't moving. What would you think? And just laid her on a cart and kept looking for drugs and couldn't find it. And that's when he heard the other officers coming and he ran. This world today, there's a lot of defund police and all this stuff. And it breaks my heart because people like my family are there to try to protect you. And even though we're not like on the road cops, you know, the prison correctional officer's job is very dangerous. These inmates can find, they're resourceful. They can find stuff to try to shank other inmates or officers and it's very dangerous. So that's all I have for this. When you see the picture, you'll see that she was such a, a beautiful, lively woman who seemed like she loved life and she had such a beautiful smile. Please be careful out there, everybody. Please. You never know who might try to hurt you or might snap one day and just gotta be more observant. This world is horrible that we live in right now and I pray that all of y'all stay safe and love one another come together, love the country, fight back. That's all I'm, that's all I'm saying. I also am going to start a new channel. It is called Curious Raven's Kiss of Death. It will have all of my true crime videos on there. So I will put a link down. I don't have anything on the channel right now at all, but I will put the link down into the description. And if you would just go follow it, and I will start uploading soon on there. I'm going to first transfer all of the videos I've already did onto that channel. And then I will start looking up more things. I want to do mystery, cold case, true crime sort of stories. And tell you all about it. And maybe help to try to find some people. And I'll try to post on it once a month. And then my true crime will not be on my regular Curious Raven channel that I have my paranormal true stories and my let's not meet true stories. Remember, I do have Patreon. Y'all can go and it's like a dollar and you can hear my videos a day early. And then if you go up tiers, um, there's a lot of cool stuff. And that is below as well. Also, my merch is below check it out. Um, I'm going to go on there and try to do some type of sell coming up in a couple days. I will let y'all know when that is. And I love y'all very, very much. I don't want to say I hope you enjoyed this because it's horrible. I just want to get Donna's story out there because to me, murders of officers and things like that don't really have a place. Like they don't get the light of day like some of these other true crime channels they're people too they have family too we just need to make love for everyone stay positive everybody i love y'all very much make sure you go follow my new channel go down below like it comment tell me who else you want me to do or talk about on my channel my true crime channel any cases you want me to cover i'm going to try to be able to research better I know I'm not the best. I'm still working on it. So bear with me. And remember, it's scary out there. Please stay tuned for my next video.